Have you ever experienced something so well crafted it not only left you impressed, but it completely changed your expectations of what something could be within the medium itself? Maybe you love food and you tried pizza in Naples for the first time. Or maybe you're an avid gamer and you manage to experience Breath of the Wild. Moments like this where your expectations are completely shattered and you have a newfound appreciation for the medium itself don't really happen that often and you can probably remember a few times where it's happened to you. For myself and many others who love the animation medium, one of these times was experiencing Into the Spider-Verse for the first time. It's arguably the best superhero film of all time. It had an amazing soundtrack. Its script was so well written, it placed it in the 101 best screenplays of the 21st century. It won many awards, including best animated feature. And the Oscar goes to Spider-Man Spider Into the spider It brought a unique approach of blending 2D and 3D animation. And with its creative approach of including many unique art styles, it helped popularize the fact that animated films can be more than just the Pixar look. I was reminded quite recently after watching its sequel, Across the Spider-Verse, of a feeling I had when I came out of watching the first one. Do animals talk in this dimension? Because I don't want to freak them out. <laughs> While I loved the visual design of both films, I couldn't quite shake the feeling that I didn't truly appreciate how well it was crafted. Even after re-watching the sequel, I was still left with this feeling and it sort of didn't go away. So I started to revisit the first film. I've re-watched the film at least six times, including an occasion watching it at 0.5 speed and also with director's commentary. I managed to stalk a bunch of artists and animators who worked on this film and even bought the art book going over it several times in order to make notes. Even after watching hours of interviews and going over lots of material made at different parts of the production process, I genuinely believe that even people who like this film probably don't quite appreciate how well it's being crafted. And with everything happening in the industry right now, with strikes, pay disputes, poor working conditions, and all the bullshit everyone faces with AI. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? I weirdly felt morally obligated to tell you just how well designed this film is. This is the first part of a series where we'll be talking about the creative triumph that is Spider-Verse. Welcome to episode one, Colour. To appreciate why the colour work in Spider-Verse is incredible, you need a bit of an understanding of colour theory itself. I don't understand it. Animation, similar to film, is an entire medium and not a genre. And because of this, colour theory can affect it in many different ways. This next section includes a bit of a TLDR of colour theory and how it can enhance stories. Feel free to skip ahead if you know all of this already, but just don't be someone that doesn't understand the basics. A Spider-Man does whatever a spider can, a spins a wave any side. First up is mechanisms. Colour itself can be thought of with three main properties, hue, saturation and value. This bar of colour very much mirrors the visible light spectrum and where something sits within it. The second property is saturation. A way of thinking about this is by picking a hue and on the right is the strongest rendition of that colour and on the left is the absence of the colour completely. And the last property of colour is value, sometimes referred to as lightness, with one end being pure white and the other end being pure black. How you navigate these properties to select a colour palette will very much affect whatever you apply it to. In film for instance, Michael Bay tends to choose really highly saturated colours to populate his frame. While on the other end, a film like The Social Network is known for having a very desaturated colour palette. And you can very much use value to make shots very bright or very dark. Even if you only have one primary colour on your frame, changing saturation and value can do so much to the overall tone. Within the film medium, colour tends to be applied to costumes, set design, and lighting, with post-production including a focus on VFX shots and the end colour grading process of a frame. The interplay between all of this very much affects the overall colour palette for a shot. 
Very loosely speaking, this application of colour very much translates to the animation medium. The overall set of choices with colour and how it comes together for a palette that is then applied to a shot or a scene can very much have different types of harmonies. By using a colour wheel you can very much see these different types of harmonies and how they work. Starting off with monochromatic type colour palettes, this is when one frame is predominantly built up by one colour foundation, with different shades and lighting building off of it. Another extremely popular type of harmony is complementary colours. This is used when two sets of colours opposite on the colour wheel are used against each other, which can create a really strong sense of contrast. Analogous type shots, on the other hand, use colours that all neighbour each other on the colour wheel. And the last type of harmonies are those created with shapes over the colour wheel. Looking at the triadic version of this, you have three core colours evenly spaced out between each other, and together they can make quite a dynamic composition. Choosing a colour palette with these harmonies in mind can create some really interesting compositions and be really pleasant to the eye. And due to this being a part of colour theory, it can very much be applied to many mediums like architecture, fashion, art, or even food. Some of you might be thinking, well why does any of this matter? In the context of a film, as long as you can tell what's going on on screen and hear everything, it doesn't matter what the colours are. The issue with this mindset though, is that our brains are wired to look for patterns, and colours very much hold meaning towards us, so if you start applying them really randomly, our brains just tell us back that something's wrong. But why is this the case? It's a fake. Empire State Photographic Department confirms it. I haven't printed a retraction in 20 years! While colour is a complicated mess in terms of what it can mean for different cultures, in a body of work made by one set of people, you can sometimes correlate colour to have certain themes and meanings. Good guys are green and blue, bad guys are red. In the comic book Spider-Man Blue, if the artist and colorist were to come out and say that the opening shots of the first issue are all in blue, were to represent the fact that Peter no longer has Gwen in his life, this would make sense as the application of this pale blue is only shown when Gwen is dead, and when she's alive she is shown as having really bright yellow hair. These two things contrast against each other really well within the story, but it wouldn't translate to any other Spider-Man story as this one is done by a set of people with a beginning, middle and an end. The question of intention should also be brought up for this rule. An example of this including colour was for the first Godfather movie. The production designer used a lot of fruits, mainly oranges, to just offset the colours from the suits which were really muted. This was so that the frame was just a bit brighter and had a bit of a contrast to it, but coincidentally a lot of the times the oranges were used tended to correlate to either misfortune or death. While the creators didn't intend for this to happen, due to the constant application of these two things being correlated, you can argue that they do have meaning. So what can you do with colour to enhance a story? A memorable application of colour is within the movie Whiplash. There's a strong yellow hue applied to many scenes within the film that either focus on musicians practicing or performing music. This filter adds intensity to the scenes and amplifies the contrast of many of the instruments. By removing this one saturated colour from the frame, some scenes just appear less dramatic, and the instruments which normally take centre focus look really bland. Within the film Love and Thunder, there's one sequence where all the colour is stripped away from the film. By doing this, the antagonist looks a lot more intimidating and the way his powers work seem a lot more unpredictable without colour. By leaving a few objects unfazed by this filter, it draws the viewer's attention to the fact that these are the only things that can defeat the antagonist. So colours can be used for a lot of different things, but what's the best application of it? If you were to ask any of the best filmmakers or animation pioneers, you'll get a similar sentiment. I think what makes cinema to me, I think ultimately it's something that for some reason stays with you so that a few years later you could watch it again. In other words, there's more to learn mm -hmm. about yourself or about life. Mm -hmm. And Because the focus of what we do is still where it's most important, and that's where the story and the characters, not because it's computer generated. By nature, the best use of colour work isn't actually just trying to make things look nicer, but it's to enhance the themes of a story. And... ta-da! I hate it. I mean, I don't even know what the theme is! What's the theme? 
It's bird fasting. Those aren't themes. There's always a theme. There's always a theme. A popular example of colour application in story themes is Vince Gilligan's Breaking Bad. Working closely with production design and wardrobe, he made sure that everything a character was wearing was consistent in relation to their feelings. Yellow was used to represent the meth business, and pink was used to represent innocence. The application of colour is so consistent, you can track character development and change over time. A great use of set design using colour to enhance themes is in M. Night Shyamalan's The Sixth Sense. Use the colour red to indicate anything in the real world that has been tainted by the other world. And a recently great example of lighting being used to show a character's internal struggle was in the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, with blue representing the light side and red representing the dark side. Anakin's gone. I am what remains. You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. A great example of color grading helping create meaning is in the Better Call Saul show. All scenes with Gene are in black and white, very much indicating that all the colour has been stripped from his life, with the only thing retaining colour are reminders of what he used to be like as Saul Goodman. A colour script is something that is mainly used in animation and can show the core colours of how it translates through a story. While it doesn't always necessarily equate to meaning, in many Pixar films they very much do. Taking The Incredibles as an example, in its first sequence we go from a very high contrast and saturated frame, very much depicting the glory days for both Bob and Helen. After a brief black and white segment showing a shift in the story, we then revisit our characters with a very different type of colour palette representing their emotions. Bob hates his job and the colour choices are purposely bland, low contrast and have little light and shadow, and you get an overall desaturated and muddy feeling. Whereas Helen on the other hand enjoys being a mother and has adapted to her new life really well, her scenes are more saturated and have higher light and shadow values. The execution of this is so well done that despite the fact that these two characters talk to each other within the same scene over the phone, you don't notice such a massive shift in colour palette. This seamless yet important set of decisions very much helps the audience empathise with what a character is feeling on screen. But what are you waiting for? I don't know, something amazing I guess. Me too kid. A bit later on in the story, the audience knows exactly what Bob is feeling when he gets the chance to revisit the glory days just by its colour. <laughs> So, great colour work can make stories better, regardless if it's an animation or a live action film. So what makes Spider-Verse so special? The colour work of this film falls into a few different categories, starting off with a foundational layer. You know, we, this is, it's, we're laying down the groundwork right now. Something that you'll have noticed up front when watching the film for the first time is those red and blue lines which give the impression it's a 3D film. The team didn't want to use traditional blurring techniques that either mimic motion or create a sense of focal length. While this is a common technique for both live action and many 3D animations, it's really not that fun for the artists. Artists can spend quite a lot of time drawing and animating characters and creating many parts of a set, only for some of them to be blurred into a complete oblivion just so that your eye looks in the right place. The red and blue colour separation is actually a problem based off comic book misprinting. Each comic book page in order to be printed out in colour well needed to be mixed of four plates CMYK. All of these would then be stacked on top of each other making your final page. Sometimes plates could be swapped meaning that you print things out in the wrong colour, or that the plates themselves were misaligned meaning that things don't line up with the artwork. But this is a problem. Why is it a good thing and why did they replicate it for Spider-Verse? The first benefit is focused. See, the red and blue ghosting forces your eye to sort of just not look at it and instead focus on things that are coloured normally. By doing this, it means you don't damage any artwork in any way and if you really just pause the frame and look at it, you can still make everything out. 
Taking a shot like this for instance, if you look at Miles and Peter, the composition and colour separation force you to look at them two first. But your brain has been tricked into doing that because nothing is blurred in this frame. So you get the focus without the blur. If you were to turn some of these scenes into black and white, you might actually find it harder to focus in the right places, so at a foundational level, colour is used to focus your eye. The second application within the foundational layer is creating camera shakes. They can create a sense of motion blur without blurring anything. This scene for instance conveys a lot of tension, but nothing is being blurred, there's just a red and blue layer being moved very quickly. It's quite interesting because instead of actually blurring anything, they've just sort of made three of a scene and moved two of them quite quickly. The next component I refer to as colour after images, because it sort of reminds me of what Goku does in Dragon Ball Z sometimes. In place of blurring something, they leave a ghosted version of a character in one solid colour to give the impression of motion. This colour then trails and then together it gives you a sense of where a character's going without blurring anything, it's really cool. I'm still genuinely baffled how a set of people managed to come up with such a novel solution by just combining two problems across mediums like this. I like to imagine one guy came in and just went, All right, here's the 411, folks. Say some motion blur is dissing your fly girl. You just give him one of these. <laughs> Next up is detail. While this is more of a style choice as opposed to a pure colour choice, I did think it was worth mentioning. Within many of the backgrounds and details from very far away, colour blobs are used to create an artificial level of detail within a scene. One test shot, but one of the key things we really discovered from it was how much we could deconstruct level of detail at a distance. Um, if you look really closely, all of the traffic in this image behind that one passing lane is all just simple color blobs. Mm -hmm. And those simple color blobs represent a full city. Uh, now some highlights from the color script. The color script for Spider-Verse doesn't quite work like the way it does for Pixar films. Due to the novel approach that this film took with 2D and 3D, there are duplicate versions of many roles, with many people being credited as art director or production designer. So to say that there is one intended approach that was always meant to be a certain way isn't technically truthful. Even for the colour keys where you get a set of thumbnails depicting a scene that should be coloured in a certain way, there are many variations of these and even duplicate versions of some scenes done in a different manner. Having said that though, there are definitely some colour choices that do map to how the film is told. Now, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, what we have here is, this is a chart I make for a film. I do this on every film I work on. And what I'm doing is that I'm charting the film as we go. This is how we're starting out. This is the overall trajectory of the movie and its palette. It's just to show that your film isn't just all up here or it's flatlined. Because if your film is all like in one section, then it's not going to be a very inspiring movie to watch. While your initial impression of Spider-Verse is, it's colourful, like many people say, it's not actually technically true, as there are some scenes that are very desaturated. So the most important way that I thought about colour on this film was balancing this idea of natural versus supernatural. So you're looking at Aunt May's house. I wanted those scenes to feel really grounded. I wanted them to feel really natural, so that when we went to these superhero moments, the color would actually turn more vibrant and turn into this supernatural color palette that you're seeing. So looking at that scene in its entirety, it starts off with Miles in a natural colored scene looking for the spider that bit him, which then very much leads to a superhero action sequence that's highly saturated. Then leads to the apex of that scene with the collider blowing up with the highest rendition of color contrast and saturation then leading into the scene of Peter dying, which is completely muted. So this is an example of how the colour script has been applied to the end film. A lot of the cut-in panels that appear in some parts of the film are nearly always very colourful. While this tends to be used for superhero scenes, heightened emotional moments, especially for Miles, sometimes are shown like this as well. And the highly stylized frames, which appear for about half a second at a time, have their own layer of colour logic. Even contrasted within a superhero scene, showing one before, during and after, have their own levels of colour saturation. The next category is meaning. 
While some of you might be thinking, this is just an origin story film, it doesn't reinvent the wheel and it very much follows the hero's journey archetype, it wouldn't have received the recognition that it did and be praised by so many people if it wasn't special. It's well directed, well written, and I just don't think that there's been a better superhero movie than Into the Spider-Verse. This story is known for having a couple of core themes, the first being choice. We all make choices in life. It doesn't feel like I have a choice You right don't! Now. Hey! His shoe's untied. Yeah, I'm aware. It's a choice. You're like me. I don't want to be. I don't think you have a choice, kiddo. Go back to being a regular kid. I don't have a choice. I see this, this spark in you. It's, it's amazing. It's yours. Alienation. I just think that this new school is elitist. Everyone knows. He's looking right at us while we talk about him. Expectations. Always find a way to come back. You're trying to quit. Our family doesn't run from things, Miles. I'm the guy who's gonna turn it off. When will I know I'm ready? You won't. It's a leap of faith. And connection. I love you, Miles. Yeah, I know, Dad. You gotta say I love you back. Dad, are you serious? Is that her? Uh, I should probably go. Still got a paper to do tonight. I love you. You don't have to say it back, though. I mean, I owe you. Okay. I love you. <laughs> Wait, what? So, how did they enhance these themes with color, and how did they play up to the fact that it's a superhero story? Think of an iconic Spider Man scene of him using his powers. Chances are, some of you thought of this one. This type of scene is called Golden Hour. It's a really memorable aspect of Spider Man iconography, and many popular media showcase this in some format. This type of scene is only really used for Peter Parker's Spider-Man, and the team at Sony could have easily chosen to just replicate it for Miles. In place of a warm afternoon glow, they chose to give Miles a cooling midnight tone. Not only is this great as it further differentiates Miles from Peter visually, but it also gives Miles a chance to stand on his own as his type of Spider-Man. Manhattan is a cold place to Miles. It's new and unfamiliar, and uh, we kind of went with that cold idea, and that's why house and any place he's comfortable in will live usually on the warmer side of the color wheel. These color decisions help to add to the theme of choice and expectations for the character of Miles within the story. The choice of making Miles jump from the tallest, scariest place with a really uninviting tone helps his ascension to Spider-Man even more. And at the end of this pivotal choice for the character within the story, he ends with a warm glow of Brooklyn off into the distance, reminding him of who he is. Next up is Spider-Sense. Spider-Sense is represented by a white and red squiggle above a character's head, apart from Spider-Man Noir. Something to help show Miles' character development and mastery over his new powers is the fact that his Spider-Sense is the only one that changes throughout the film. His Spider-Sense is blue and black in place of the red and white. It's that what would be red as part of his Spider-Sense is blue and also engulfs the whole screen to really show that he can't focus it at all yet. This scene might have had a different colour palette applied to it for his spider sense, but I'm glad they went with this one as it very much brings it back to cool Spider-Man colours. His spider sense only looks and behaves like his peers towards the end of the film. A bit of a tangent, but in this scene the spider sense triggers based on who's got the most experience first. While we only got one segment in the film where spider sense was shown this visually engaging, it was still extremely well done. Most media's portrayal of this power is really subdued in terms of either signal or sounds. The Raimi films have a really good visual representation of Spider-Sense, even though it doesn't work half the time. That's a cute outfit. Did your husband give it to you? Bit of a note, but I think that the colour work and visual presentation of how it's done in this film actually inspired some comic books to change how they do Spider-Sense. In the comic book line Non-Stop Spider-Man, they changed Spider-Man's Spider-Sense to no longer have a lightning bolt or squiggle, but instead have the action that Spider-Man needs to do, almost as if his subconscious is talking to him. Within the first film, when Miles and Peter meet each other for the first time and their Spider-Sense sync up, you can very much see that Miles' Spider-Sense has the Prowler theme attached to it in terms of colours being purple and green which ultimately then ease into Spider-Man colours, showing that Miles is now Spider-Man. You're like me. Most superhero costumes tend to pivot around the three primary colours on the colour wheel. 
Depending on how many of these colors are used, there's also an additional layer of how much of a color is used in relation to the other ones. There is sometimes some costumes that only really use one color, but they're a bit more rare. This is a bit of a loose rule though, and you will find lots of characters that don't follow this rule like the Hulk or the Thing. And broadly speaking, villains tend to be based off secondary colors on the color wheel. But very much like the primary color rule, this one is also fast and loose. Because of these color pairings, artists can come with their own individual style and your compositions with heroes and villains will always be dynamic. By nature, most of Spider-Man's villains have green as a base to counter the red, with yellow, orange or purple being accent colors. I should note that there is a sub-theme of Spider-Man villains that just don't have any color, but they're a bit more rare. But what about Miles and his visual identity with colour? Miles has the most visual changes and costumes throughout the film, probably to echo the amount of character development he has. Something that I thought was quite interesting visually is seeing the distinction between Miles being a normal human to then being Peter's version of Spider-Man, then back to focusing on himself, and then being his own version of Spider-Man. One thing you'll have noticed is that Miles' suit is all black with red accents, which is really different from the normal Spider-Man suit of red and blue. While initially you might not think that this is a big deal, trying to create a new color palette for the same hero can present some challenges. If somebody was to say that they were redesigning the thing from the Fantastic Four and show you a concept, but instead of orange, it was purple, it just wouldn't sit right with you. Designing a character that's just too much of a ripoff versus another one that's just too alien to what it's meant to be based off of can be really challenging. Within this film, they did a really good job of making Miles feel distinct and having his own visual identity. They also very softly added in red and blue throughout a lot of scenes to just subtly indicate that he is Spider-Man. I wanted the environment to represent the Spider-Man colors, the Peter Parker Spider-Man colors. Miles will eventually find his. And the snow actually has that Spider-Man red to it. And we now have all these purples and blacks in here. My favorite execution of this is during Miles' leap of faith sequence where he chooses that he wants to be Spider-Man. He's constantly accented by red and blue colors throughout many shots. Bit of a side note, but I thought it was quite cool that they teased Miles having all three primary superhero colors. And it's a no on the cape. I think it's cool. Take that off, it's ah. disrespectful. Spider-Man doesn't wear a cape. No capes! Ah. Perhaps this was a bit of a missed opportunity, but in some of the concept arts for some of what Miles' suit could have been before he chose his final one, some of them look really interesting. While not exactly superhero-esque, they do look quite cool in relation to what Miles probably would have designed it as. It would have been a nice thematic choice because this suit also has the colour of purple, which at this point in the story, Miles looks up to his uncle more than any other character. And it further differentiates itself from Peter's early suits, which are nearly always shit. The character of Prowler has some really interesting colour design choices within this film. The original design for the mainline universe's Prowler is very much a purple and green combination. But that Prowler's costume didn't belong to Aaron Davis, it belonged to Hobie Brown. Nope, not the one you're thinking of. Within the comic books, Aaron's version of the Prowler is more similar to a cat burglar with a spy motif, whereas Hobie's version is more of an anti-hero who builds his own costume due to his knowledge of science. The team blended elements from both of these characters to make something quite new. Many of Spider-Man's villains tend to be based off animals, Prowler's design takes inspiration from tigers. Hobie's dad was even referred to as Tiger, and one of his brothers eventually became the martial artist known as Black Tiger. While in many versions of the concept art they used the original colours, they ultimately went for a deep purple look. Prowler has an element to his design where he has glowing features as part of his costume. It's predominantly used to accentuate the hands that look like tiger claws. And in scenes where Prowler is chasing people, predominantly Miles, the scene very much is filled with Prowler's colours. We're all gonna die! These colour and design choices around the hands actually benefit the story's themes. With Aaron being an important mental figure for Miles, him teaching Miles about the shoulder touch, something that brings focus to the hands, ends up making him be a better Spider-Man. 
Miles has two powers that differentiate him from the normal Spider-Man, turning invisible and his Venom Strike. With Venom Strike being his most powerful move, it very much glows in this film, very much mirroring Prowler's hands. It's also no accident that the Venom Strike is in blue, which is the only colour left for Miles to have traditional Spider-Man colours on his costume. Perhaps Aaron didn't let him down after all. I'll let you down, man, I'll let you down. Miles' colour theme of black, red and the occasional glowing light blue can also be seen on the spider that bites him. Out of all of the spiders in this film, and Pig, that bite our heroes to give them powers, Miles is the only one that has his spider mapped to his costume. I mean, technically, Spider-Man Noir's also counts, but not really. Or the spider, uh, gang. Most of them tend to have a red and blue costume, with a few exceptions. Besides Spider-Man Noir's monochromatic theme, Gwen has probably the most unique costume out of everyone in the team. Not only does her costume lack a lot of red and blue, it generally lacks colour altogether. This is to make her stand out against what is probably the most colourful universe out of all the Spider-Man worlds. The pink very much offsets the green ballet shoes, which is a key part of her character. White and black are the two most noticeable colours out of her costume, both as a superhero and as a civilian. And this is to make her look like she shouldn't be part of this colourful world, which at this point in the story she's very much disconnected to. Spider-Man Noir and Spider-Pig sit on the complete opposite ends of saturation. One of them has no colour altogether, while the other has the most vibrant and strongest set of red and blue out of anyone in the Spider-Man team. What a pig. I'm right here. Penny's Spider-Man robot, SPDR, is one of the only other characters besides Miles and Aaron that have glowing accents. Her world is strong in a neon aesthetic and is all red and blue. One of the most colourful aspects of this film is Penny's power-up sequence, which is very anime-esque. The two versions of Peter in this story are actually a bit different from each other, even though they have the exact same costume. The Spider-Man from Miles' universe that dies is often shown more contrasted and more lighting affecting his character. While the Peter B variant of the character ends up being Miles' mentor, I did notice that they mask his Spider-Man colours with regular clothing throughout the film. Perhaps the masking of the traditional Spider-Man colours with other clothes is to reflect the fact that he doesn't really want to be Spider-Man at this part of the story. Only really being the final version of Spider-Man at the end of the film, where he himself has gone through some character development. The villains have some pretty interesting colour choices within themselves, with at least one of them mapping to one of the core secondary colours on the colour wheel. Despite examples of these three colours, I did notice that on the costumes themselves, they're very desaturated and for the most part low lit. This does help them offset them when they stop fighting the heroes within this story. And yes, they very much have a villain that doesn't have any colour, very much to counter Spider-Man Noir. Besides Prowler, Kingpin is probably the most interesting villain in terms of how they approached him from a colour perspective. They wanted Kingpin to very much feel like a black hole, and he very much engulfs the frame whenever he's on screen. Historically, when Kingpin is shown being an intimidating businessman and choke-slamming superheroes, he's normally wearing white or a Hawaiian shirt. But in this, he's wearing black, almost as if he's at a funeral mourning the death of his family. When the Collider exploded for the first time, Kingpin's model was stretched out four times, with a layer being yellow, blue, magenta, and black which maps to the colour printing process from before. Almost as if the explosion was so strong and dimensional breaking that it broke the comic book pages from what this thing was based off of. The two collider sequences are some of the most tense parts of the film and it very much mirrors that in terms of its saturation and contrast. While the frame is filled with saturated colours that are constantly changing as the fight progresses, I did notice that when the story calls for it to focus on Miles, the room very much mirrors his colours and any time a character goes within the portal, it very much flashes in their style. While I couldn't find too many examples of this, if there's an object that's brightly lit and presents a danger towards a character, it very much washes away the colour of that character completely, just to further double down that that character's in trouble. In summary, the colour work for Spider-Verse is so phenomenal that it can create visual tension, replace motion blur, replace focal length, create an artificial sense of detail, create further dynamic compositions in relation to story themes, visualize character progression, show moods within a story, visually represent superhero theming from comic books, and differentiate characters from one another.
enhance superhero iconography, and finally, at least for me, change the expectations of what colour can do within the animation medium. Look out for part 2 in this series. Next time we'll be focusing in on the styles of this movie and why they're so unique. This is... purple. Now. Blue. Now. <laughs>